now. She's the founder of the site League of Justice. Legal analyst uh, Amy Dash is back with us on the show. Amy, long time no talk. How you been? I'm doing great, Craig. How are you? I am doing well. Uh, in a way, it's a good thing that we haven't had to add, have you on because typically we have legal analysts on when people are getting sued and in trouble. And for once, it's not actually the commanders. It's it's just the NFL. Um, can you fill us in on, on this? I don't know whether it's already at the point of lawsuit, is investigation. What is happening between the state of California, the state of New York, and their attorneys general and the National Football League? Sure. Well, those attorney generals have decided to open an investigation to explore whether they can bring lawsuits against the NFL under federal and state laws for employment discrimination. And this has to do with protected classes of people. So that means you cannot be discriminated in the workplace uh, based on your gender, your race, your sexual orientation. There's a whole list, your age, there's a whole list of these protected categories. And at this point, there is enough evidence and there are enough active lawsuits and allegations for them to say, okay, we believe that the NFL may be fostering a hostile workplace where people are being discriminated against based on their race and based on their gender and where there's potentially been active sexual harassment that has been cultivated by this culture that the league is propagating. So when like, New York is where the league office is. Um, Obviously, the NFL Network is in Los Angeles. Is it just about what is going on there, or is it about um, potentially, like for instance, things that happened at the Washington Commanders and some of the franchises within the league? Like, is this just league office? Is this teams? Is it all of it encompassed in a larger case about the NFL? That's a great question. So there's not a focus on individual teams. It's based, it focuses on the league itself. At this point, um, there's enough that has been handed over to these attorney generals. If you'll remember, the, the allegations by more than 30 employees against the commanders, that reached Congress. Congress did its own investigation. It then handed that information that it gathered over to these attorney generals and said, we want you to see if any of this evidence, any of these allegations and testimony can be used to build a case against the NFL as a participant in all of this. So while they're not focused on the commanders, that was sort of the catalyst. Uh, for these attorney generals to say, okay, not only do we have 30 employees from the commanders, but we also have a recent uh, woman who worked at the top ranks of NFL media, who rose to be a vice president, who was recently uh, let go and filed an agent gender discrimination case back in March 2022. We have the Brian Flores lawsuit, which alleges you know widespread discrimination. Um, in in the hiring in terms of race, Jim Trotter, uh, NFL media, he ended up confronting Roger Goodell about league hiring practices on national television. And at that point, uh, he alleges that he wasn't treated so nicely. And, you know, I think something might be brewing in terms of him as well. So there's, there's so many people at this point who are willing to come forward. And what happened after the congressional inquiry is that six attorney generals issued a letter to the NFL saying, we believe that your workplace as a whole has problems, including your front offices in New York and in Los Angeles. Uh, They have multiple locations, headquarters. I believe they're also in New Jersey. And they also invited a lot of the people that were making allegations against teams to file complaints with their individual attorney general offices. And what that did is it then gave them the impetus to say complaints have been filed by people We have amassed a whole uh, variety of these different complaints that give us the cause to go and investigate the league as a whole. Amy Dash, legal analyst, League of Justice, with us here on the Team 980. I remember talking to someone a couple months ago and talking about, like, the Mary Jo White report for the commanders, for instance, and they're like, yeah, like, obviously that's important, but the one the NFL is really scared of is the Flores lawsuit. Where does this fall in terms of, real threats to the NFL? Like, what what kind of threat is this to the NFL? 
the Flores lawsuit or this one right now that's investigating the NFL as a whole for workplace discrimination and, and uh, hostile sexual harassment? Th- this one, um, which, as you this said, one. kind of encompasses some of the similar themes. Yeah. So I think uh, what type of a risk this poses, obviously, it doesn't look good from a PR perspective. This is not a criminal case. Uh, a lot of this may be handled administratively by the um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, it depends if, it's, if any of the claims are brought under federal law, which prohibit discrimination um, under the Civil Rights Act, or whether they're brought under state laws. Uh, but essentially, it could be either administrative or it could result in some sort of a civil suit. And some of the remedies really depend on what kind of laws are invoked. But uh, they could be anything from, you know, uh, forcing the NFL to stop certain behavior, forcing them to rehire certain people, uh, to pay back wages if there's been discrimination in terms of gender, uh, in terms of like people, you know, some of the allegations were that men were hired and promoted over women who were equally as qualified or potentially paid more. Um, So getting back pay, getting reinstated, there could be a forced change in behavior and policies. Um, and, and really, like, the bottom line is that Letitia James and a lot of these attorney generals have a track record of making people pay a lot of money to give restitution to people that they've proven have been wronged in these situations. So as long as they can prove that and there's genuine discrimination of a protected class or genuine harassment of a protected class, people could stand to make a lot of money and potentially the NFL may be forced Uh, to change its behavior and policies. Because the key thing here is that they're looking for patterns and practices. So that is why they're doing this now. There have been enough lawsuits, enough people coming forward that they have a good shot at proving patterns and practices of unwelcome behavior in the workplace. So the NFL's response then becomes really interesting. They said they don't like explicitly deny the allegations in the at least the the part of their response that I read in the Washington Post yesterday, but they said like we have made a huge effort in these areas. We have policies and practices in place that not only achieve these by the legal standard, but of higher standards, of a moral standard uh, and, and kind of you know best in class, if you will. So what do you make of the NFL's response where they say, like, no, we, we are trying here. Like, is it possible that they could get away with it, so to speak, if they're trying and just haven't succeeded fully? Like, does it come down to the execution? Like, how, how does kind of the the desires versus the execution uh, all come out in this? Or is the NFL just trying to cover their own tails and they're actually full of it? It really comes, I don't know their motivation. I don't know, you know, what they're actually enforcing. But I think the execution is key here rather than the formality or the facade. So like 37% of women who work for the league uh, in the front offices, 37% are women, 37% are people of color. So, of course, they have policies that they put in place. There's a lot of rhetoric, by the way, after what happened with Ray Rice. That was a long time ago uh, when he punched his fiance. And at that point, you know, the NFL had to come forward and take a stand against domestic violence. And people have called them out for being hypocritical, hypocritical in terms of punishing people who have committed domestic violence since then. Um, but generally, I would say, like, the feeling – from people that are filing these complaints, at least, uh, people that are initiating these lawsuits and people that are testifying before Congress is that these policies are are smoke and mirrors, that this is not uh, anything that is enforced. And in fact, in practice, and that's what really matters here, there is a pattern of abusive behavior um, and a boys club that goes on within the league offices. And this was even mentioned during the congressional hearing uh, by somebody who said they believe that, you know, the league here is responsible. There, there have been lawsuits, multiple lawsuits, where the league itself has been attached as a party, um, including, you know, uh, allegations of collusion in terms of the commander's report and not releasing that information, not being transparent about the findings of the initial investigation. So I think r- really right now, it all is going to come down to what can be proven. And uh, don't forget, testimony is is a lot of times considered to be proof as long as the person is not deemed to be uncredible. Amy Dash, legal analyst, founder of the site League of Justice, with us for a few more here on the Hoffman Show on the Team 980. 
Uh, critics of these suits would probably immediately say, well, these are two DAs that are trying to score political points. Isn't there something better to do? Why Why are these important lawsuits to bring in for you know the state of New York, for the state of California? And do you agree that they, they are important to bring? I agree they're important to bring um, because, like I said, there are enough people who have come forward with this pattern of allegations. Uh, is there a dog and pony show element to it? Yes, there always is, because a lot of these attorney generals, you know, have political aspirations and they've gotten to that to that role by uh, doing high profile things against high profile corporations and individuals. So, sure. You know, is the NFL a great target? Yeah, they can get a lot of money from the NFL for the people that they feel are wronged as long as they can win the cases. But um, I also think that with the tens of thousands of documents that Congress was able to compile and the number of witnesses willing to file complaints and come forward, there's absolutely cause here for them to pursue some sort of an investigation against a high-profile corporation that really does set the tone for what's acceptable a lot of times in America in the workplace because of the NFL's large influence. Yeah, definitely. I, I did a longer piece on this yesterday, Amy, and I, I tried to ask that question without leading the witness, I, so to speak, to use a terrible legal pun. <laughs> um, but I think I did. But it, like, you're you're going to have attorneys general sue gigantic or investigate gigantic organizations, corporations, just because it's one that you like the product doesn't mean it's any less valid. And like you said, they still have to win the case. And And if this makes a a larger point about, hey, Amazon, you better behave because you could be next or Microsoft or small business or whoever, like, okay, the NFL happens to be the example, but if there's no there there, there's no case in the first place. So like you can't, there's only so much that can be called political grandstanding if there's actual merit to the case. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Uh, now, do they like to pull the tricks where they make the announcement at the podium with the big, you know, the big uh, blown up cardboard with the diagrams and they happen, just so happen to make the announcement like days before the NFL is going to release its schedule. Yes, they love to do that in terms of timing, you know, um, to sort of get the publicity uh, towards their office rather than the NFL. And of course, it's going to make headlines. But listen, this is a long process. This is just the very beginning of it. These investigations could go on for years and there might be large swaths, uh, like, large areas of time that we don't hear anything about what's going on and that doesn't mean people aren't hard at work so i think this has been a long time coming um especially when the attorney general sent that letter um and and to give you know the nfl the benefit of the doubt they even said listen they sent us this letter six attorney generals asking for cooperation we haven't heard anything from them since we were willing to cooperate and now all of a sudden they're announcing lawsuits. So are some steps being skipped here? Is there a lack of cooperation um, in terms of just trying to pressure and humiliate the NFL? Yeah, I think that's part of it too, because at the end of the day, if the NFL is willing to come to the table and, and provide back pay or restitution or change policies, that is always easier than having to go through the whole litigation process. It's easier for both sides. So there's always going to be this public, uh, you know, media effort to try to bring people to the table so that they can get the easiest resolution possible. Last thing I'll ask you, Amy, if you're the lawyers on the NFL side of this, are you just trying to settle this basically as soon as possible make sure this doesn't go to discovery, that there's no damning texts or documents or anything else that comes out here or or is this something that you're you're trying to fight to say no we we've been doing this we're better than this or would you just be like all right how much money do we owe and uh let's get this let's get this off the books well i think they probably love to do that but of course they have to you know keep up the pr aspect of things so i think initially they have to deny everything which they usually do and fight it we're gonna fight it you know and then what happens is everybody gets because also don't don't forget there's a strategy here so if you just come to the table and you're like yeah we'll give you whatever you want right then you've given all the leverage to the other side and they're going to ask for a lot and then they know they've got you so i think like both sides sort of play it um they end up going down the process and going through all of the documents and then at a certain point um you know people's true cards start to show so for example 
if the attorney generals have some really damning information and the NFL feels that it really can't fight it or that if it gets out, uh, it's going to reflect poorly on them or that it's a smoking gun, you know, then maybe they would be more likely to sit down and say, okay, how much do you want? How can we get this resolved? Um, But I think nobody wants to hand over the type of money that they're probably going to want to ask for something like this, you know, and it all also has to be measured as to, you know, which claims actually have validity and who's just trying to jump on the bandwagon because they were fired and they're unhappy about it and they've got an ax to grind. Um, And, you know, I would say the one thing the NFL has to be really careful about is any type of appearance of retaliation for the people that have filed complaints. Because that's another step of unlawfulness that could get them into even deeper trouble here. Yeah, definitely. Amy Dash, uh, you can read more about this on her site, League of Justice. Amy, it's always great to have you. Thanks so much for your time, and have a great weekend. Likewise, you too. Thanks so much. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.